Welcome to another episode of the Minnesota Meatloaf Podcast. And today is a very special episode for a couple of reasons. One, it's our 50th episode. And number two, Ooh. we have a really special guest with us. We have the very talented John Bermuda Schwartz with us today, who is well known for being the drummer with Weird Al. Uh, uh, that's true. And uh, thank you. And glad to be here. Yeah. Nice to meet you or see you, uh, whatever nice, we're nice doing. To, uh, <laughs> nice to cyber meet. It's right. A cyber exactly. Meet. exactly. So when did you start? Uh, when did you become a drummer? You know, when did you learn or when were you interested in it? Uh, I started, uh, well, actually my, my first instrument, I was probably eight or so. I was, oh. I played accordion of all things. Oh, nice. And, uh, uh, but my brother played drums. He had been playing drums or taking drum lessons for several years at that point. And uh, he switched to guitar and I inherited his drums. I was nine years old and uh, I started taking lessons. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that was the beginning of that. I, I didn't really have any notion about what it could lead to or what it meant. I just, maybe I was just tired of the accordion, leave that to someone else. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's a little more talented than I. And uh but that's that's where the drumming began, and we were living in Phoenix uh, at the time. And uh, I was I was young and uh, took to it quickly and listened to, you know, at the time uh, Beatles records. And my parents also had Gene Krupa albums and uh, Alan Sherman albums, you know, some comedy nice. albums and Latin yeah. orchestras. And also, I had a lot of uh, influences before I became too cynical about music and what was good and what was bad <laughs> and what I liked. And uh, yeah. you know, it was all just it was all good. Uh, so I had a lot of a lot of influences. You know, Gene Krupa to me was the same as Ringo, you know, in yeah. terms of sitting behind the drums and making noise. Yeah. And uh, and I still certainly appreciate both. Um, when uh -huh. what were some of your first uh, professional gigs as a drummer? I was probably I, I I guess in 76, 77. And, and I'd been, uh, playing already about 10 years at that point and had been in some bands, but as far as making money, I started doing some, uh, demo sessions, uh, around LA. Uh, my, my first group, I guess, a uh, real group to go out and make money was probably about 1977. Okay. Uh, I, I played, uh, I played with a band called honeymoon and it's a top 40, like a cover band. And we had a regular gig at the holiday inn in Glendale, California and, uh, six nights a week. Nice. And I, and so that, and that was a full-time job for me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I didn't have a day job at the time. I, I had a nice apartment, you know, back in the days when, you know, you could make a little bit of money and still have a nice place to live, you know, right. unfortunately <laughs> housing is outpaced salaries, but uh, yes. back then it was, it was very doable. And uh, I was very proud at age 20 and 21. I mean, I literally had my 21st birthday in a bar that I'd already been playing for several months and That's we didn't, awesome. we didn't tell them it was just a quiet celebration, but uh, <laughs> that, that was, I guess my first real proper money-making job. And, uh, and then that led to some other bands playing around town and, uh, mm -hmm. but it wasn't long after that I met Al and uh, began oh, yeah. working with him. Okay. And, uh, how did you and Al meet exactly? We met on uh, the Dr. Demento show. Now, Dr. Demento did a live show in Los Angeles. Actually, that's how he began, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and before it was syndicated, before it was nationwide. And we met, uh, I was being. Uh, there's a there's a little bit of a backstory uh you know uh, when you're in junior high and high school you you always listen to the dr demento show at least the kind of weird kids did and <laughs> and some musician friends of of mine uh from school band which again no no guitars or basses i mean it was all horns and stuff mm -hmm. uh we got together and recorded a song that was sent in for a contest dr demento was running this was early 1973 and okay. uh, we didn't win the contest, but we came in second place. And our version was an instrumental version of the song. So the doctor started using it for the intro to his show because he could talk over it because there weren't oh, nice. uh, there weren't already vocals on it. Uh, yeah. And and we thought, oh, how cool to be getting you know one to have done so well in the contest and two to actually get some airplay. So we sent in another song. Uh, mm -hmm. the, again, these were not originals, but we sent in yeah. another home recording, and he played that. And then a. a about a year and a half went by. We sent in another one, and he played that too. Oh, wow. anyway, and this was at a time when he wasn't really playing homemade recordings that much. Uh, some years later, 1980, actually, I got an invitation to come down to the show, uh, see the show broadcast live, and to meet Doctor Demento. And by this time, uh, a number of local artists and national artists had begun sending in homemade recordings. You know, and and uh, 
that had become a significant portion of the show. Weird Al was one of those as it happened. I uh, went down, met Dr. Demento, and he invited me to come back and do an interview and talk about some of those early recordings that I did, being mm-hmm. one of the first people to have homemade music on his show. Mm-hmm. So I came back, it was September 14th, 1980, and Weird Al was there that night. He was answering phones and just being Weird Al. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and I knew who he was, and yeah. and we uh, he, he wanted to record, not record, he wanted to perform a song he had just written that weekend, Another One Rides the Bus. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> parody of Another One Bites the Dust. And he had just written it that weekend, and, and the doctor had given him, it was just like a four-hour show back in those days, and yeah. he had given him a, a slot, I think, during the top 10 uh, uh, requested songs that they would play every night. He gave him a slot in there to just perform it over the air live. And so I got asked to beat on his accordion case. There weren't, you know, he was playing accordion, but there weren't really instruments per se. So I I beat on his accordion case. And then after that, you know, we exchanged phone numbers and, uh, and, and stayed in touch. And uh, he, he was in school. He came back from school a few months later. Uh, We recorded a few things, put that out as an EP. Uh, did a few other gigs, got a band, got a record deal, and mm-hmm. here we are. There you wow. go. What is the record like when when you guys are working on a new album? What what's kind of like the process? Like, does L say you know we got a whole bunch of um I, I have a whole bunch of ideas for songs you know and you know will you guys learn these songs or how does how do you yeah, guys do that? That's it. He says we're doing new <laughs> songs. We go. Great. <laughs> uh, well, the, the each album is a, is about half original songs, and often mm-hmm. off, often those are in the vein of some of his favorite artists or other popular yeah. artists. Uh, not exact copies, but legally, yeah. you know, just just around from that. And then the, the other half is uh, the parodies, uh, mm-hmm. of which one, sometimes two, are meant to be singles. Uh, yeah. there's often a polka medley of popular songs done all strung together polka style. Uh, the, the, uh, now the parodies, and, and this is the easy part, uh, since we know the goal was to reproduce the production value and the sounds and, and the performance mm-hmm. of the original song that we're parodying, we already know what we're supposed to do. There's no rehearsal. Yeah. There's no nothing. We just, we right. figure out what we're doing, get together in the studio sure. and literally play that for the first time, uh, in the studio. And then. If it goes well, and it almost always does, we we uh, we record it, and it becomes a, a, a take. You know, and then mm-hmm. it goes in the album. Uh, the original songs, uh, the the process is Al will do a, a a personal demo. Sometimes it's just in the early days, it was just him and the accordion, and he would just okay. sing it. So we'd have the arrangement, we'd have the lyrics, the melody, etc. Uh, we would then, as a band, with Al, get together, kind of rehearse that, massage that. And make a recording of that. So this is now the okay. second demo of of yeah. the original. And then Al would listen to that and and kind of take that in. And if there were any comments, he would give those to us. And if there were any changes to be made, we could do those in the studio. Sure. So then the next step after the second demo was to go into the studio and record it for real. We might rehearse it or change a thing or two, but we were mm-hmm. about ninety percent there when we walked into the studio. On the parodies, we were expected to be a hundred percent there. Yeah. Okay. And we we were there because there weren't any changes to be made. There was nothing to work on as a band. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. Assuming we could play together, and of course we could. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so that's that's basically the process. Typically, awesome. the originals uh, would be written at Al's leisure, and at some point when he had five or six of them together, we would then go through the process. And very often we go ahead and record those. Those would be in the can, and sometimes mm-hmm. uh, you know a few months or or up to a year later. Uh, depending on the interval between albums, uh, he would start presenting the the parodies to us. And typically we would record all of those at once. And okay. we would, the polka medley, because it wasn't really strictly parodies and, and wasn't intended to be a single, mm-hmm. may have been recorded with the originals or it may wait until the, uh, the parody recording mm-hmm. sessions. So ideally we would go into the studio on two occasions. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes... Uh-huh. Sometimes we'd record a bunch of parodies and the the single was in question. And it's like, you know what, we got to get the rest of these out of the way because if we get permission for the single, we got to get right on it and and finish that up and get, you know, we don't have time to do five parodies at once. Well, let's get the four yeah. out of the way. We'll we'll do the one and then we're ready to go. And uh so, that happened a, a few times uh on some things where uh we were just waiting on the single. Mm-hmm. And uh and when that happened, we would go and record that one song, that final song, and the album would be out about six weeks later. So it was a pretty wow. quick process. 
Mm-hmm. Awesome. When, you know, talking talking about a physical album and and artwork yeah. and mastering and all the and production and all the rest. You know, nowadays yeah. and without a record contract, uh, we can put out anything we want, anytime we want, uh, immediately. I mean, yeah. as soon as as soon as it's mixed, it can be online that night. I mean, it could be out yeah. immediately, and that yeah. was just not possible in the days of physical uh, oh. media. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well. Do you guys all live kind of close by each other so you can go into a studio or do you guys all have to fly in when you guys we we did we did all live in the LA area. Uh-huh. Uh four of us do now. The keyboard player has has been up north up in the San Francisco area for some okay. time, which is where he's from. So that's kind of home for him. And yeah. and it's not really ever an issue to uh get together for him to drive down right. or fly down or whatever it is. But we're we're Spread out a little bit, but yeah. mostly mostly in the LA area. Okay. And, uh, but back in the day, uh, we we were all in LA, in the LA area, and it was very easy rehearsals. Sure. You know, nobody had to get a hotel to do rehearsals. You know, two yeah. days in a row. You drive home, and you know we were close enough to to make that work. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, LA and Al's always been in LA. Uh, he was mm-hmm. born in the LA area and uh, has always been in LA. Okay, awesome. Uh, were you involved in uh, the movie UHF at all, besides musically, or do you make a cameo at all, or anything like that? Or? No, we we didn't appear in it as actors per se. Now, there's a video uh, in the movie. There's a dream sequence, and Al's thinking about you know being a you know the, the money for nothing yes. Beverly Hillbillies, mm-hmm. and and we appear in that. But okay. that was basically created as a music video. Okay. Uh, as far as the movie itself, we did. There's a lot of uh, underscore, a lot of music that goes on throughout the movie. Yeah. A lot, very orchestral stuff and some cool. And there's some. We're involved in a fair bit of that. Awesome. Uh, so we we uh, are heard, but we're not seen. And uh, of course, we're heard on the ending theme uh, that goes over the credits, and uh, and we're heard and seen in the uh, in the Money for Nothing video sequence. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. Do you do you have any songs that really are your own particular favorites? I know it's probably like asking a parent to pick their favorite kid, but <laughs> anything that just st- has over the years really had a place in your heart, or it's it's really hard to say. I mean, I I I like them all, and for different reasons. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm particularly proud of of a couple of them. Uh, a virus alert of all songs. Mm-hmm. I'm really proud of that, and for for and it's not that the drums are that. Uh, that's not an amazing part. But that was one of those songs that could have and maybe should have been sequenced, programmed right. by me. And but I played it, and and we, I mean, you know, again as an original song, these are the parts that we agreed upon. And yeah. you know, when when we play them, it's like, okay, well, we'll play that in the studio. But it was really, really, I did a really, really good job on it, as simple <laughs> as it was and straight. And it sounds, it sounds like it could have been programmed. And, yeah. and I, which I think is a great, you know, not that it's sterile, but that it's right. very, it's very tight. It's very precise. Yeah. And that's something, you know, a lot of musicians say, oh, this whole click track thing, it's too sterile. Music's meant to breathe and all that. And they forget how much they used to revere artists and bands back in the day that were really tight and yeah. could really keep time. And they forgot about that whole concept. And now that yeah. it's, it's a, a, a you know, electronic device keeping it. Now yeah. they're all mad about it. Yes. Uh, I I don't care. You know, it's either way. I get to. I'm responsible for the drum parts. Whether sure. I, you know, I, and I've I've learned a lot. I mean, it's been great. If I didn't do it, Al would bring in someone else that did, and uh, mm-hmm. I would feel like I had been left out or like I just wasn't doing my job. So the fact that I've kept up with that and I've learned and grown as a as a drummer as a musician, I've become a sound designer now yes. uh, for for drum parts. Uh, I'm very proud of that. You know, so Al has has uh well encouraged and and uh, forced me to grow and that's that's a good thing yeah yeah so like a song awesome. like traffic jam where there's a lot of different sound effects and percussion and things like that is is are you involved in the mixing of that and not the mixing but but the programming i mean that's a, sure, a program yeah. song of course uh yeah. i may have i probably provided all the sound effects for that nice uh I mean, I, I typically do because I have just a, a really amazing library of stuff. And if I and if there's not a sound effect for something uh, that's that's an organic type sound, I will create that. Nice. Uh, so there was a there was a song uh, trapped in the drive through, okay, uh, which is which is a parody of uh, confession. Uh, no, not confessions. Uh, tra- trapped in. Uh, I can't it's, think of it. Is it the closet one? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, that's a different. That's that's a that's stuck in the closet with Vanna White. That's a. Different oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, <laughs> at, at any rate, this was and it was a long song. This was a song I, I probably worked on the hardest. It probably took about mm -hmm. thirty hours to program this. And they say, well, thirty hours is not that long. Well, it is a long time. And if if you consider that most programmed uh, drum songs, most of them, as a, a four bar loop, mm -hmm. you have to figure out four bars. And you just add them up, and sometimes you you mute a part or something like that. But basically, you only have to worry about four bars worth of of parts, which mm -hmm. goes very writing those out goes very quickly. Getting the sounds together it's a lot more difficult. And there's one one uh, one of the many sounds in there is kind of a it's like a drop. It's like a a, a water drop, you know, kind of yeah. a whoop. yeah. And un unfortunately, I discovered later figured out later where where the artist the producer of the original song probably got that and it was something that had been on in my library for years but mm -hmm. i went through and i i recorded <laughs> and i set up a mic and i went through and i was i was doing the whole you know, <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah i can't i can't do it right now and i've still got the original i, I did about 30 of them nice. and one of them was perfect and i put it in there and you know it worked out great and, and i figured out later that so, oh it was part of a microsoft media computer <laughs> sound for something and that's mm. undoubtedly where the guy got it and i listened to it i said yeah that's the thing i got really really close to it and i don't think anybody would have known right. but that was a song that had that had all sorts of uh just inc incredible parts in it lots mm -hmm. a lot of stuff going on yeah. and and uh that was let's see yeah oh and we also that was also fun because we got to do uh, a little section that the whole thing about being trapped in the drive through is you're sitting there and sitting there and the guy turns on the radio and this mm -hmm. rock rock song, a recognizable song comes on. Yeah. And, and the original plan was to have like, I, I think we were going to try and do ACDC back in black again, just, just the guitar riff. So when you hear yep. that, it's like, you know what that is. There's no lyrics, but you know yep. what it is yep. and we'll record it. We're not trying to sample the original thing. And, uh, we wanted to do, I think, uh, I think actually Al wanted to do uh, Led Zeppelin uh, uh, rock and roll, rock and roll. No, Black Dog, Black, Black Dog. Dog. <laughs> and and uh, he was waiting and didn't didn't hear back from uh, you know from Plant or his people or whatever. And and then it was the next choice was uh, I think the ACDC, and he got turned down on that. Mm -hmm. And he finally thought, well, you know what? If worst comes to worst, we can do my Sharona. Yeah, because <laughs> you know sure. we got permission for that once. We could certainly you know record that with no problem, and and we did. We went ahead and recorded mm -hmm. uh, just the intro part because mm -hmm. uh, we just needed like eleven or twelve seconds of it, mm -hmm. and and we recorded that. Sounded great. Sounded really <laughs> really great. And and they're starting to mix the song, and and just then after we'd already recorded this other thing, just then Plants people came back and said, "Yeah, you can go ahead and and use uh, Black Dog." Oh. <laughs> so, so he said, oh great now we got to go record that i got to figure out how to play like bonham anyway so we did that <laughs> so but the great compliment is 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 everyone that heard that and they heard this little insert you know of of the of the black dog theme you know da 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 da, da, da. and and they all said oh how cool it is that they let you sample their record <laughs> a, a great compliment mm -hmm. to, yeah. to us yeah. uh and and we've been accused of that so i mean back in the day when we really didn't sound quite like the originals you know mm -hmm. if you listen to eat it versus beat it they're they're a little farther apart yep. than uh than we became later we got really good at that stuff oh, back then it's yeah. but people would say oh how cool you got to use michael or, you know or oh he just uses michael jackson's tracks he just uses mm -hmm. the artist's tracks that's you know which was supposed to be a slam to us as the right. players yeah. uh well we you know we we uh we were laughing all the way to the bank yes mm -hmm. exactly. so, actually nowadays you you just kind of smile when you use the app so same thing yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> yeah. do you have any projects you're currently working on or can talk about or some you know something coming up uh well as far as al we will uh i mean the plan is to go on the road in 2025 Okay. Uh, we don't have any dates yet. We don't have any, mm -hmm. uh, you know, anything booked at this point. But that's the plan based on yep. our our regular schedule of we do a couple of years on the road, not yep. the whole year, but we we work for two years and we take the next year off. Well, twenty twenty four is the year off. Okay. So twenty twenty five is. 
the next logical year to tour and it has been discussed but there's there's nothing in the works yeah. right now it's still a ways off uh yeah. but but i've been working with and and this has gone before and during uh you know my my tenure with al i play with other bands in la okay uh, and and multiple bands and uh and i'm back with i'm, I'm playing with three bands subbing with a fourth Mm-hmm. you know and and then there's al coming up uh, yeah. next year and uh so uh, you know I, I do one or two gigs a week which is fine you know yeah. it's, uh, so you keep busy <laughs> I, I keep busy you know because i just i enjoy playing you know and i don't uh, you know i i i make a couple of bucks on those gigs but i don't rely yeah. on them uh to live i mean fortunately you know they pay a couple of bills here and there and it's you know a little bit of spending money but more yeah. than that i i do it because i like playing you know i don't mm-hmm. i don't have to and that's that's how I want it to be is, and that's why I still enjoy it. And I'm, I enjoy yeah. playing for 15 people or 1500 or whatever it is. It's all the same to me. I enjoy it all the same. It's yeah. great. And then really quick, um, could you mention a little bit about your, the book that you came out with not a little while ago, the black and white and Al. Or I've got Al, to, weird. I'm sorry. Black and white and weird. <laughs> black and white, black and white, and weird all over. Yeah, no, no less. Uh, yep. That's that's the first of two books, actually. Uh, that book came about. I, I had. Uh, well, I'm the archivist. I've, I've archived everything. This had nothing, little to do with Al. I've always documented and kept and filed away and written down everything I've done, uh, mm-hmm. you know, musically. And uh, I had. Uh, and I always and I always took photographs. I always had a camera when I was living at home back in the seventies. I had a dark room. I mean, I developed my own film, and uh, I uh, in archiving, digitizing all of my audio, uh, open reel tapes, DATs, cassettes. Of course, uh, I finished that project. I thought, you know, I better. I better start thinking about all this film I've got because that's that is a another physical thing that can deteriorate. Now I store things carefully. Anyway, I was going through and starting to figure out uh, all of the the film and what it would take and all that. And I had a whole, and I always shot a ton of photos with Al. And this is 2017, by the way. Mm-hmm. And I go through and I and I'm looking at a bunch of photos from videos and in the studio, black and white, that I had never had printed. A couple of them got printed and and were used for Al things and, and had appeared in publications, but only a couple uh, out of thousands. So I was going through and I thought, you know what? Nope. Nobody's ever seen these photos. I mean, Al hasn't seen, you know, they were just literally on contact sheets filed away in my, in my uh, file cabinet. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'll I'll bet this could be, uh, I hate, what's the word? Oh, monetized. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I don't, I don't want to sound too, uh, you know, mercenary, but more more than anything, I thought, you know what? I'll bet, I'll bet people, the fans would love to see these. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I, I started to investigate. Not about the the uh, archiving of the film, but about publishing. And I looked into self-publishing a little bit. I, I looked into, uh, and, and the self-publishing thing didn't really uh, appeal to me. I figured out very quickly, and it, it may work for some people. It wasn't going to work for me. They, yeah. Their job is to sell you the books so you can then hopefully sell them. Yep. Yeah. That's their job is to sell you books, not to help promote them. Sure. Uh, and, you know, because I don't know where to go to get a, a book printed, really. So, you know, that would be one outlet. But yeah. I thought, you know, this, this, uh, there's no rush, whatever. And I was on tour the next year with Al and, and was talking with uh, one of, one of the people. And I had already worked with Sony on, again, from, with, from my photo library. Again, none of this archived, none, none of it digitized yet, but they had come over to the house and uh, a couple of times went through all of my photos. I scanned, retouched, did all sorts of, clean up on things and they wound up in a in a 122 page booklet that wound up mm-hmm. in a box set in a 15 oh. album box set that came out in 2017 oh wow uh so i had i was working closely with some of the guys at sony on that so yeah. they when we were playing in new york uh new york city they came out to the show even though we're not on sony anymore we're still mm-hmm. you know friends and they came out and i was talking to, the, to one of the guys i had been dealing with uh, mike duquette and he says uh what what do you what are you working on? I said, well, I, and I just, thankfully it popped into my head what I'd been doing the previous summer. I said, well, I'm starting to think about digitizing all of my negatives and I've got a bunch of photos that the fans have never seen. I'm thinking about putting out a book. And he says, yeah. oh, well, that's, that's a good idea. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, he emails me. He says, uh, 
if you're if you haven't moved any further on that book idea, here's a guy, here's a, a friend of mine who's a publisher, does oh, nice. uh, uh, pop culture coffee table books. Awesome. Might, might be a good fit. Yeah. I thought, okay, that's, that's, good. that's good. So this is already, this is starting to be fall of, uh, yeah. of, uh, God, I forget, I forget what year. I forget what I, no, you know what? It wasn't the next year. It was after that. I'm sorry. I got to get the yeah. timeline right because this <laughs> all happened very quickly. Uh it was a couple of years after my original idea. We were on the road. Uh, it was 2019. And that's when I talked to Mike Duquette. And he says, uh, and he sent me the email. Anyway, I contacted the guy, uh, Matthew Chonaki at 1984 Publishing, and and presented my idea. And this was maybe like November of 2019. And uh, we went back and forth for about a week. And, and a, like a week later, we signed a contract. Huh. Oh. And and uh, first order of business was to start digitizing these uh, negatives, mm -hmm. and uh, which I did, and uh, they turned out great. And uh, went through and and did some cleanup on them and uh, ran them all by Al. If if some of the other guys were in the in the photos, I ran them by them to make sure they were mm -hmm. okay with it. And uh, you know, with the intention of putting out this book, and the book came out uh, approximately a year later. Came out in November of 2020. Yeah, and oh, just wow. in time for Christmas. You know, but, yeah. but, and again, this is something that a, a self-publisher wouldn't have done. They, they targeted the right time. Uh, mm -hmm. They, they were, he guided me on certain things about uh, simple things like the title of the book. I didn't, that was not my title. I had, uh -huh. I had what I thought was a very clever title. Yeah. Uh, it don't matter if they're black and white yeah. <laughs> from, from the Michael Jackson song, which yeah. we had done a, a parody of, or at least live. Yeah. Uh, and and I thought, well, that's a that's a the fans will get this, you know. And then mm -hmm. the subtitle was something like "Unseen Photos from the Camera of John Bermuda Schwartz." Mm -hmm. So the uh, uh, the publisher, about a month in, the publisher says, "Well, you know, about, about your title." Yeah. <laughs> um, for, first off, the the Michael Jackson reference, you know, it might might be a little old at this point, you know. It's, right. it's clever, yeah. but yep. and then and then there was all this Michael Jackson controversy that had come up again. Mm -hmm. He's already yeah. he'd already been dead. But right. it had come up again. He says, you know, maybe that's not a good thing to to have that on there as a book title. You know, you don't want a single bad comment anywhere about yeah. what an unfortunate right. title it was. You know, and he says, second, you don't mention Weird Al anywhere in the title or the subtitle. You know, mm -hmm. be be nice yeah. to put his name in there. So if people are searching around on Amazon, let's say, uh, yeah. the the book will come up in their search, and maybe they'll buy a book. Yeah. I thought, oh, that's that's great. I said, yeah. that's why you're that's why you're the publisher, and I'm the drummer. Yeah. Right. right. So anyway, a self-publisher would not have done that. They just said, oh, great title. Oh, great subtitle. And they would yeah. have left it up to me to market it to the fans, which the fans would have got it. But the book has gone beyond just fans. I mean, yeah. at least beyond his hardcore base. Uh, anyway, that worked out great. Uh, and a book actually sold out within a couple of years. Yep. Uh, Al was very kind in 2022 to take uh, to take those on as merchandise. And awesome. sell them at the merch table, you know, yeah. for those who hadn't, for some reason, already bought a book. And Al helped me sell a bunch of books. That's and awesome. Al, and of course, Al made money on them too. So this yeah. was this was, and they sold out as a result of that tour. They yeah. they sold out and have not been reprinted yet. At any wow. rate, the the we were already in progress on a second book, and the second book uh, involved uh, it was all color photos. And a much wider span, the black and white and weird all over book was mm -hmm. a very short span that I shot black and white with Al. Mm -hmm. and it was 1983 to 86. Okay. Uh, this other one, but I'd been shooting film all along. So this other one uh, involved the very first photos I've shot of Al in 1981 oh, cool. mm -hmm. through the last film I shot on him in 2006. So that's a 25-year wow. span. We had 50% more photos. Uh, the name of this book and and the, the guy who came up with the black and white and weird all over also came up with this title, Lights, Camera, Accordion. Awesome. Again, yep. I wouldn't have thought of that. And then, <laughs> like that. And then uh, so, some, again, Al was mentioned in both subtitles in both books. He was mentioned, you know, first one was Black and White and Weird Al over the lost photographs of Weird Al Yankovic. So you get oh. Weird Al in there, you get photographs, you get Black and White, you get Weird a second time. Yeah. Uh, and actually, if you chop up the Weird All Over, it becomes Weird Al Lover. So uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, wow. the, the guy, and wow. I'll give him, I'll give him a, a shout out here is Mark Jonathan Davis, who goes by Richard cheese okay. uh, of, of lounge against the machine where he does lounge versions of, 
of uh, metal and and rap and and other okay. song. Very talented guy, but he he's a comedy writer from way back. And I had to contact him about something else, and he came up with that title. He says, "By the way, if you don't have a title for on this first book, you know, for your book, how about Black and White and Weird All Over?" And I I didn't know I was going to need it yet, but yeah. it's a good thing. Good thing he came up with that. So yeah. I tapped into him for the second That's book. A- second book has done well. Uh, it is still available. It hasn't sold out yet, but we haven't mm-hmm. really uh, had a chance to say take it on the road and, and offer it as merch. Uh, yep. That could possibly happen on the next tour. That would be great if it does. Yeah. Uh, so two books. Uh, third book, not sure. Not sure okay. at this point. I think I've got uh, all the photos out there that, that are worth seeing. And I should add that that the difference between me having photos published in the past uh, and these books now is that uh, these are scanned from the negatives and oh, they okay. are, they are, cl- the density is, is great. They're dead clean. Sometimes the crop is bigger because, you know, you'd have a three and a half by five photo that you'd scan and that was never the full frame. So sometimes oh, okay. there's, if someone's in half the frame, now that I, now I've got like their whole face because well, I've got, good. I've got the full negative. So they're seeing the photos in quality that awesome. they've, they could have never seen them before. And plus a lot of photos they just never seen, but yeah. some of them are repeat photos. I mean, there's just some great photos. If I do say so, that yeah. bear repeated uh, publishing and there's yeah. no way to get around that. Yeah. Uh, but they've never, ever seen them in this quality. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, nor had I, I mean, I, yeah. you know, I didn't know 40 years, 50 years ago that you could scan a negative. I mean, no. mm-hmm. the technology just much less that you could do it at home. Yeah. Uh, which I did. I spent more than four months every day scanning rolls of film. Wow. Every wow. day. Every wow. this was in 2021. <laughs> we weren't on the road. I had nothing yeah. to do. And yeah. every day, three, four, five, sometimes six rolls of film a day. Wow. And uh uh it was it was and I was so glad when it was done. I just it was, it was <laughs> not not to be done with it, but what a what a sense of accomplishment accomplishment it was. Cause those yeah. things, when they're gone, they're gone forever. A lot of those things, yeah. maybe I had given away the only print. Mm. Uh you know, and the and the others wow. where they exist as prints, they're they're uh you know, that's the quality they are. They don't get any yeah. better. Well, now I've yep. got them. Uh they're all cataloged, it's in a database. I can go right to any negative anytime. Uh, you know, they're cross-referenced, uh, you know, a lot, lot with a lot of keywords and very easy. Hey, have you got that picture of us, uh, you know, when I was standing next to yep. the James Brown statue? Yeah, that's on, that's here. I, I can get to it in a, in a couple of minutes. So that's awesome. very glad to have done that and very glad that the books have been well received. Yeah, great. Well, John, thanks a lot for taking the time to do this interview with us and Thank being you. on the Minnesota Meatloaf podcast. I just want Thank to you. say real quick that the first ever concert I went to in my life was Weird Al Yankovic, and you were there, obviously. Uh, so, and Weird Al has been a big part of my life. I've mm-hmm. been a fan. So, just thank you for all the enjoyment. 